Hi friends, welcome to the Spooks. We're out here, out here in the Spooks. Spooks, do you have anything to say? Spooks? Spooks. You can be spookier than that. Spooks? Oh, that was a good one, wait, do that again. Spooks. Yeah. Hi, Slenderman. Hi, do you want to be friends? Do you want to adopt me? I'll even give you $20. Canadian or American? Oh. You know what? I'll make it 20 euros, Slenderman. I just realized the microphone was in my pocket that entire time and it probably sounds like shit. Hi, Slenderman. Hi, friend. We are in the right place right now because I don't know where the fuck we are. Are you whistling? Yeah, there's some leaves right there. Slenderman, I love you. I'm such a big fan. Do you want to be my dad? What do you know about Slenderman? What do I know? Yeah, what do you know about Slenderman? That he's a long, scary man in a suit with a questionable face that no one really knows. What do you, what do you mean nobody really knows his face? It's a blur. Yes, he does not have, he doesn't have a face. Yes. He has no facial features. You play a lot of Slender the Eight Pages in the seventh grade? Yes. Good. Well, twice. What? I only played it like twice. Okay, I think I played it like twice too at camp. <laughs> I watched the YouTube video playthroughs of it like everyone else. Not if Slenderman gets us. <laughs> Slenderman lore can vary quite a bit depending on your source, but there are a few generally agreed upon characteristics. He is abnormally tall and thin, usually around eight or nine feet tall. He has no facial features. His face is completely smooth and perfectly white or sometimes gray. His arms are an interesting situation. He might be able to extend his arms. He might first of all, have very abnormally long arms, and then he might be able to extend the arms, but those arms also might be tentacles, or he might have a lot of tentacles that come out of his back and normal arms. Or normal arms... Sorry? Who's reporting on all of this? The internet. Humans, when in close proximity to Slenderman, might experience a sort of sickness, sometimes called slender sickness, which usually consists of a very violent cough, sometimes headaches, sometimes nosebleeds. If you are stalked by Slenderman for a prolonged amount of time, it may cause memory problems or loss of time. You also know that you're in Slenderman's presence when all of your technology starts malfunctioning. Generally, if you try and capture video and audio of Slenderman, you'll get Oh yeah. Oh, you'll get a lot of uh, visual tearing in the video as well as like crazy staticky anomalies in the audio. Your phones might stop working. Oh. Who are you gonna call? Oh, no, Ghostbusters can't find you here. Slenderman generally lives in woods, but not woods out in the middle of nowhere minding his own business. He always seems to be in the woods near human settlements. However, he can go anywhere. He's not bound by normal space and time. He can follow you home or he can just appear in your bedroom at night if he wants to. What exactly Slenderman does to his victims is unknown. He takes them. He kills them. It's unclear. They just tend to vanish. He seems to enjoy the chase more so than anything else, slowly driving his victims increasingly paranoid and insane. And he really feeds off of that paranoia. Like once you see Slenderman for the first time, if you keep thinking about him and fixating on him, that's when you're doomed. That's when he'll keep coming for you. He's mainly interested in children, although he does sometimes go for adults, especially those adults who provoke him. Hi, Slenderman. <laughs> Come be my friend! I want to hug with all those tentacles! He may lure them into the woods, he may attack them while they're unsuspectingly passing through, but as I said, what happens to them when he gets them? Nobody really knows. Slenderman myth will by nature always be incomplete and flexible, and that is what makes him so powerful. He's always able to evolve to become something new for each storyteller. Therefore, the Slenderman mythos is comparable to folklore. My previous video goes way deeper into that argument. It's all about creepypastas as internet folklore. I discussed how a lot of creepypastas can be classed as folklore because of the way that they're created communally, the way that they sort of take on new character with each storyteller. It's very reminiscent of like oral traditions of the past. Creepypastas are also internet folklore in that they reflect our experiences with current technology, with the internet, and our anxieties around it. The spot where a lot of people get just booped my microphone. The spot where a lot of people get like hung up and pedantic about this is that we know the origins of creepypasta stories. Traditional folklore has like this magic and this mystery to it because these stories developed over hundreds and hundreds of years. So 
nobody knows who told the first story or how it originally developed. It just feels that these things have always been part of the communities that they grew out of. Whereas with creepypastas, the process of creation is very, very fast and is documented in timestamped posts on the internet. We know exactly when Slenderman originated. It was June 10th, 2009, and I'm gonna take you back there. But first, a word from this video's sponsor, Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service which allows you to try out new fragrances every month. They have perfumes, they have colognes, they've got all kinds of unisex options. This is my jar of Scentbirds that I keep in my bathroom. Because I work from home, I don't use perfume every single day, so I find that the bottles actually last me quite a long time. Whenever I'm getting ready to go out, I, I sniff a few of them and I go, what's What's the mood? Are we feeling fruity summery? Are we feeling autumnal? Are we feeling approachable or are we feeling scary broody goth lady? They come in these really cool bottles. As you can see, they're not these little baby sample bottles. They really are a full month supply, or in my case, like three or four months. They sent me Candy Sugar Pop by Prada. The name of this one scared me a little bit initially. I thought it was gonna be like sickly sweet or something, but I actually really like it and it's not sweet at all. It's got vanilla, bergamot, and apple. So it's really just very like warm and fresh. I got Proper Poppy by English Laundry. This one's a bit sweeter. It's got raspberry and peach, but it's also got this interesting depth from the musk and sandalwood. I also got Bloom by Gucci. This one is so flowery. It fits my personal style a bit less than the first two, but I think I'm gonna come back to it in the dead of Canadian winter when I'm yearning to be in a garden in the summer. What's really cool about Scentbird is that you get to learn what you like, you get to try things out before committing to a large and potentially expensive bottle of perfume. Scentbird lets you try out those same expensive bottles for just $17 a month. Scan the QR code and use code strangeons 55 off for 55% off your first month at Scentbird. Go check it out. That deal is available if you're in the US or Canada. And now back to your regularly scheduled content. On June 10th, 2009, Eric Knudsen posting on under his pseudonym Victor Surge, responded to a challenge on the Something Awful forums to create paranormal images through Photoshop. He produced these two photographs and captions. One of two recovered photographs from the Sterling City Library blaze, notable for being taken the day which 14 children vanished and for what is referred to as the Slender Man. Deformity cited as film defects by officials. Fire at library occurred one week later. Actual photograph confiscated as evidence, 1986, photographer Mary Thomas, missing since June 13th, 1986. We didn't want to go. We didn't want to kill them. But its persistent silence and outstretched arms horrified and comforted us at the same time. 1983, photographer unknown, presumed dead. These are excellently done. <laughs> Most of the other photographs posted to this thread did not have any accompanying caption, accompanying story. Um, there really isn't much of a story here, but there's like, there's the perfect amount of information to like get people's brains spinning and wanting to fill in the gaps. And that is exactly what the other forum members did. Nudson, right from the beginning, was very encouraged and, and excited by this interest in his character. He did a lot of um, the very early content creation around Slenderman himself. He added more photoshopped images, creepy children's drawing, newspaper articles, and the like. Early extrapolation on Slenderman by the other forum users really latched onto this idea of Slenderman appearing at the sites of disasters, like with the library fire post. Inserting Slenderman into history was one of the first ways that people fleshed out this character and this mythos around him, which I find super interesting. Like this, this reality, this unreality, like, element was there like from the very very beginning like Nudson set that up with with the photos that he decided to create. These are woodcuts dated back to the 16th century in Germany featuring a tall disfigured man with only white spheres where his eyes should be. They called him Der Grossmann, the tall man. He was a fairy who lived in the black forest. Bad children who crept into the woods at night would be chased by the slender man, and he wouldn't leave them alone until he caught them, or the child told the parents what he or she had done. The image here, supposedly from a woodcut, um, shows this skeletal figure with multiple limbs. It is, in fact, altered from this original, um, in which the skeleton does not have multiple limbs. This post also featured a journal entry from 1702, by a man whose son had disappeared after reporting seeing Der Grossman. Another user followed up this post by, by posting a, a loose retelling of this Romanian fairy tale they remembered, which they think sounds a lot like it features Slenderman. And when you read it, yeah, it's very clearly Slenderman in this Romanian fairy tale. Interestingly, the hype around Slenderman did not die out after just a few days like you would expect a lot of internet fads to, but weeks later the thread was still active and almost entirely dedicated to this new character. However, the Something Awful forums were actually behind a paywall for members only, 
and were considered somewhat exclusive, for Slenderman to truly become the phenomenon that he would, he needed to breach containment. Only 10 days. Like 10 days after Nudson's original Slenderman post. Two Something Awful users, film students by the names of Troy Wagner and Joseph DeLange, whose imagination was captured by Slenderman, posted their first video on the Marble Hornets YouTube channel. Marble Hornets was a found footage series following the story of a student film entitled Marble Hornets sort of gone wrong when the director Alex finds himself being stalked by Slenderman, becoming increasingly paranoid and filming himself at all times. Fragmented footage that we see being posted to YouTube is being sorted through and investigated by Alex's friend Jay. Alex has since disappeared and Jay has come into possession of the footage. Jay quickly finds himself being sucked into the story and pursued by Slenderman himself. Marble Hornets established a lot of the popular tropes in Slenderman stories. His interference with technology, his apparent manipulation of time and space, his effects on memory, his ability to induce sickness when in proximity to humans. Many similar found footage series and videos and ARGs followed Marble Hornets. The two other most popular ones were Tribe 12 and Everyman Hybrid. The popular marriage of creepypasta with the found footage genre in this era is just meant to be. It's it's really, really smart on the part of the Marvel Hornets creators. Yes, we had some films before this that were very ahead of their time, like the Blair Witch Project, but encountering these kind of like casual, fragmentary, personal, authentic videos on YouTube, that's what YouTube as a medium is kind of meant to host, and therefore the reality bending factor is so much more. Let me okay, so <laughs> You're watching, you're watching paranormal activity in a movie theater. Maybe the pool cleaner jump scare gives you a little spook, but you were always removed from it to a degree because, partially because paranormal activity is not a very good movie, but partially because you don't normally watch other people's home videos in a movie theater. The aesthetic that the film is putting on is very much trying to mimic reality. However, the medium of it being this, this polished film is, is still getting in the way of any feeling of real authenticity. Whereas when someone comes to YouTube and is like, look at this insane footage I captured, or this is me vlogging my personal experience with this thing. That is exponentially more of a mindfuck because this is content that we would normally watch on YouTube that seems normal for YouTube, except for this one twisted supernatural element. The popular web series were also the first to introduce the idea of proxies to the Slenderman mythos. Proxies were humans who also stalked and tormented the protagonists of the series. They were driven insane by Slenderman, often to the point of becoming violent. It's not clear in these early depictions whether these people are like directly working for Slenderman or receiving orders from him, or whether they've just kind of lost their minds and are acting out in some kind of way. The thing that caused Slenderman's fame to absolutely skyrocket was the Slender the Eight Pages indie game that came out in 2012. Horror games and like horror game reaction videos on YouTube were a massive, massive trend. Most of us, as much as we are adults now and would be ashamed to admit it, have seen a video of PewDiePie screaming while playing Slender. The concept of the game is very simple. The player is wandering around a dark forest illuminated only by a flashlight beam. They have to collect these eight creepy drawings before Slenderman gets them. He pretty much always gets them. As you play, creepy music gets louder and louder. The screen gets glitchy and staticky in a Marble Hornets fashion. If you manage to catch a quick glimpse of him without getting caught, you would better fucking run because he's about to get you. I remember that year, 2012, it was absolutely every Everywhere. I remember some kid had it on their computer that they brought to camp one year and we were all passing it around and playing it and seeing how far we could get, which was usually like one or two pages. I think at this point, Slenderman was a household name easily among kids and maybe adults who, who spent a lot of time online, <laughs> but I think the average adult still didn't know what Slenderman was, but if I had asked most people in my seventh grade class, I think they would have known about Slenderman because of this massive trend. Do you think Slenderman would like me? Do, I think Do you think he would like me? Well, I don't think he uses Tinder. Um, this is more his, um, this is what, this is where he finds the women and the men. This, this is where you find love with Slenderman. Is he one with the woods? Sometimes, yes, actually. Okay. Um, there are some stories that say he's like, because he's very tall and slender, he's like a tree. So people will be like, oh, it was like a tree moved and it was Slenderman or... Are we going? I think, yeah, we're going the right way.
In an interview about his creation of Slenderman, Eric Knudsen said, I was mostly influenced by H.P. Lovecraft, Stephen King, specifically his short stories, the surreal imaginings of William S. Burroughs, and a couple games of the survival horror genre, Silent Hill and Resident Evil. I feel the most direct influences were Zach Parsons' That Insidious Beast, the Stephen King short story The Mist. I used these to formulate something whose motivations can barely be comprehended and causes general unease and terror. He has also cited The Tall Man from the Phantasm films, The Gentleman from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and Jack Skellington as inspirations. In their book Folklore, Horror Stories, and The Slender Man, the development of an internet mythology, Shira Chess and Eric Newsom also link Slender Man to this Spider-Man character called The Question, who wears this blank all-white mask, and whose real name is Victor Sage, which is very similar to Eric Knudsen's username, Victor Surge. What I'm trying to say is that Slender Man is a culmination of a lot of other established characters and horror tropes. Personally, I think that the fact that Slender Man is really not all that original kind of works in his favor as a monster, because even if it's our first time ever hearing about Slender Man, we already have this feeling that we've seen him before. The term the uncanny is used to describe things that just really freak us out as humans on some fundamental level, because there is some element of them that is human or familiar, but it's wrong. It's too tall. It's impossibly proportioned. It's inhumanly pale. It's missing facial features. These are very common tropes in horror because they're effective. So is the man in the suit monster. A monster with authority, a veneer of civilization, perhaps a stand-in for the oppressor, the capitalist. This thing that young people are taught to look up to, even to aspire to be, to inherently trust. And this sick, terrified feeling arises when they realize that they can't. Shira Chess and Eric Newsom write, By visually establishing the Slender Man as almost human, but with unfamiliar qualities, Victor Surge and those who followed avoided the overt horrors, for instance, the gaping maw of a werewolf or the blood-soaked teeth of a vampire, in favor of something uncanny, something more psychologically troubling. There is no bloodletting here, only a discomforting feeling that something is very wrong. What makes Slender Man so effective as a monster, what makes him appealing to all of these different storytellers that have adopted him online is exactly the fact that, that we don't know his motives. What he embodies is not a specific fear of death or violence, just this feeling that something is very wrong. Whether you're a kid awake in the middle of the night in your quiet house, a teenager walking home through the woods after dark, a young adult living on your own for the first time and filled with existential dread, Slender Man can give a face, or lack thereof, to those undefinable anxieties. Slender Man can be anywhere. He can be anything. But nobody really believes in Slender Man, right? How could they when we all know that he was created in a Photoshop challenge online in 2009? Despite this well-known fictional origin, most Slender Man stories are presented as if the teller believes in them, with what Jeffrey Tolbert deems in his essay Dark and Wicked Things an atmosphere of belief. Stories are told in first person, this happened to me, or I heard this from someone who this happened to. Photographs, found footage series, these are all mediums that treat their subject matter as real. There's always this tension between fiction and reality with Slender Man. There's this whole extra layer of uncanniness that comes from not being able to trust your own senses, what you are seeing and hearing right in front of your eyes, or what someone is telling you is true. Early Something Awful posts like the German woodcut image, the journal from 1702, the Romanian fairy tale, these originally, like in their original context on the Something Awful forum thread, were very clearly people just playing along with Knudsen's first Slender Man images and the stories that accompanied them. However, these stories were later reposted to other sites, uh, like creepypasta.com, to Reddit, uh, without that context, leaving people with only these first-person accounts and apparent evidence of Slender Man's reality. People pointed to the fact that he appears to be in prehistoric cave paintings in Brazil, in Egyptian hieroglyphics. There's a very strong connection to fairy folklore. He lives in the woods and abducts children or, or changes them in some dark way. Like, it's fairies. Slender Man is a fairy confirmed. And of course, there are many, 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 many more examples of Slender Man appearing in history and past folklore. Trevor Blank and Lynn McNeil wrote in Fear Has No Face, Creepypasta as Digital Legendary, it is often as easy to find evidence for Slender Man's historical presence in antiquity as it is to find proof that he was created from the whole cloth in 2009. Slender Man's reality is not actually a very simple thing for people to get to the bottom of. And even if you know that Eric Knudsen created him in 2009 on the Something Awful forums. That fact is still not necessarily enough to deter one from believing in Slender Man. People don't really believe things based on evidence. People believe things because they want to. 
Not that they sit to themselves and think, I want there to be a big scary guy in the woods who's going to steal me with his tentacles. And maybe, maybe, they, maybe some people, maybe some people do want that. But most people don't want that. They want to be entertained. They want to be thrilled. They want to be taken away from their boring lives for a little while. They want to feel part of something larger than themselves. Our brains naturally seek patterns, and we want all of this evidence being presented to us online to, to fit a pattern, to make sense. It really doesn't matter that Eric Knudsen photoshopped the first photos of Slenderman in 2009. Perhaps Slenderman has always existed and Knudsen was just drawing on some subconsciously known truth. Something that has clearly influenced the horror stories that we create for a lot longer. Or perhaps Slenderman really is a character that was created for the first time on the Something Awful forums, but that doesn't mean he can't become real. People took this idea that Slenderman really relishes in, in stalking people, in, in the pursuit that slowly drives them insane, increasingly paranoid. Um, that is much more central to Slenderman's character than like what he does to his victims. We don't know what he does to his victims. We only know what happens to them in the days and weeks before. That letting him take up space in your mind, or God forbid, seeking him out, is pretty much guaranteed to make things worse for you in that situation. And people connected this to the idea of a tulpa or a thought form, which is this idea out of 20th century mysticism that you can summon something into reality with the power of thought. Knudsen said in an interview, before you had angels and succubi and then ghosts and spirits, Today we have shadow people and interdimensional beings. Slenderman and other newly created entities are just the newest addition in the progression of a long and very real, very human tradition. You've seen him, and now you can't unsee him. Hi, Slenderman! Do you want to adopt me? Do you want to be my new father? I, it'll be super normal, I promise. Maybe we're too old. He prefers children, I think, but he has been known to go for the odd adult. Why does Slenderman take people? Why is he particularly interested in children? Maybe he wants a family. Maybe the monster is just misunderstood. You know, this is why I'm always on about why Jordan Peele's nope is so genius. What is traumatizing and monstrous to some humans might not necessarily be evil, but just different. A type of creature that doesn't perceive in the same way that we do. There's a popular alternative reading to the Slender the Eight Pages game that goes that Slenderman has a young son who draws these pictures of him. And Slenderman is a very proud father, and so he posts these drawings all over the forest for everyone to see. And then you, the player, are going around stealing those drawings like an asshole. So obviously Slenderman is going to want to get those back. There is this hard, masculine, violent, colonial, kill the monster because it is evil, it is other approach to horror a lot of the time. But what if you looked at the horror and you realized that it deserves compassion? What if you recognized something of your own treatment by other humans in it? There is a Slenderman story entitled Cold and Dark in which a young blind girl runs away to the woods to escape her abusive father. There she finds a slender man who offers to restore her sight in exchange for her becoming his proxy. In this story, becoming slender man's proxy entails taking him as like a sort of surrogate father figure, moving into his mansion where he lives with other creepypasta characters like Jeff the Killer and Eyeless Jack, as well as other slender siblings. The protagonist of the story tells us, I became addicted to the tales and soon enough desired to be part of their dysfunctional family. The undead, the slenders, and their proxies, hand in hand living together under one roof. I wanted that understanding, that feeling of being accepted. It is everything I never had. Interesting little touch in this story is that Slender Man does, in fact, brutally kill his victims. And while the narrator is initially put off by this, she soon discovers her own ability to kill for Slender Man. She is able to kill using only the rage projected from these new magical eyes given to her by Slender Man. Yes, I have looked everywhere for this story. Yes, I want to read it so bad. I, it's not online anymore. I am relying on uh, Shira Chess and Eric Newsom's summary of Cold and Dark, but oh my God, I wish I could read this. Stories like Cold and Dark have, uh, I want it. Um, have mainly been relegated to fanfiction.net and thus deemed fanfiction. That classification does not necessarily feel wrong. Uh, there are some tropes present, which are certainly reminiscent of fanfiction, but can Slenderman fanfiction technically exist if there there is no concrete established canon? Everything after Eric Knudsen's original two images are technically fanfiction, yet it is only certain types 
of Slenderman stories, which have been deemed fan fiction. Creepypasta.com, Reddit, um, other sites where you tend to find this kind of content are heavily moderated and uphold certain standards, including that stories stick to the horror genre rather than drama or romance. We have legitimate masculine horror versus illegitimate girly fan fiction. Fan practices of women being degraded, etc, 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 forever. The sympathetic, protective Slender Man, the, the father figure or the love interest, was perhaps a little too reminiscent of sensitive, sparkly vampire boyfriend Twilight for the 2009 internet to handle. But in my opinion, this is an avenue of Slenderman lore that is very worth exploring. Because rather than sheer terror, a monster does sometimes provoke sympathy, yearning, love. There was never a place for that in the established male-dominated creepypasta communities. It doesn't make it a less valid way of processing emotions and fears through writing horror. I have deliberately just told you this. I have told you this in this specific order because I am leading you to a place. <laughs> I am doing a segue here um, to the big looming thing that everyone always wants to talk about when we talk about Slender Man. In 2014, five years after Slender Man was originally created by the Something Awful forums, two 12-year-old girls stabbed their friend 19 times at a sleepover birthday party with the goal of becoming proxies of Slender Man. Now to Wisconsin tonight and to a new development in the trial of those two young girls, 12 years old at the time, accused of luring their friend into the woods, attacking her, leaving her to die, all to impress a fictional character on the internet, Slender Man. Two 12-year-old girls allegedly stabbed their friend 19 times. Their alleged inspiration, this. A quest to please this fictional and uh, quite honestly creepy Slender Man. The gruesome new details emerging just this week about a horrific tale that began to play out on a Saturday morning this past May. A birthday sleepover with three 12 year olds the night before. And now two girls are missing. The other, Peyton Leitner, has somehow crawled out of the woods covered in stab wounds. Morgan handed me the knife and then I started to count again. When I was five feet away, I said, Now go ballistic, go crazy. The suspect lured the victim into the woods. All three of the girls are 12 years old. Who's ever heard of two 12-year-old girls planning for six months to kill one of their best friends? How in the world does this happen? I would hope that I've given you a good set of information so far in this video that you feel a little more prepared to approach this question than uh, news anchors in 2014 did. The inherent unreality of Slenderman stories makes it very possible to encounter convincing evidence of his reality. And there are lots of outcast kids who identify with the monster. I think these two girls absolutely did fit into that category. Upon looking into this, it's... The real story of the, the Slenderman stabbing is not the one that is widely told. One of the girls involved, Morgan, was diagnosed with early onset childhood schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is very rare in children. It generally starts to develop around a person's late teens. However, Morgan had been hallucinating since the age of three. Completely untreated, unknown to anyone. She had no knowledge of her mental illness, but she knew that she had literally seen Slender Man. So of course she and her friend believed that he was real. And although they were attracted by this outsider figure, they wanted to be his proxies, they were also terrified of him, that now that they had made some sort of contact by acknowledging him outright, that if they didn't do what he wanted, he could easily kill them and their entire families. In her book, Slender Man, Online Obsession, Mental Illness, and the Violent Crime of Two Midwestern Girls, Kathleen Hale addresses this issue from a long overdue alternative perspective. This book was only published in 2022, by the way. She talks about how American society views Empathy for those who have committed crimes as wrong upholds punishment to the highest degree as morally correct and just. Kathleen Hale spent many hours with Morgan um, as she was writing her book, and she discovered that to really deeply examine the Slender Man stabbing case of 2014 is to examine the abysmal mental health care of the US, to discover that the largest hospitals are prisons. The horror here that emerges is not Slender Man or even the internet's influence on our impressionable youths. Immediately following the stabbing, the local police chief said, Keeping children safe is more challenging than in past years. The internet has changed the way we live. 
It is full of information and wonderful sites that teach and entertain. The internet can also be full of dark and wicked things. It is also providing an opportunity for potential child predators to reach children like never before. Unmonitored and unrestrained access to the internet by children is a growing and alarming problem. This should be a wake-up call for all parents. Parents are strongly encouraged to resist and monitor their children's internet usage. We must also remember that online is much more than spending time on the computer. Now smartphones and even video games are completely connected to the outside world. Parents, please talk to your kids about the dangers that exist online. And this really set the tone uh, for reporting on this case for many years to come. Slenderman and Creepypasta finally became household names to adults as well. Only this time, it was as these horrible, corrupting, dark and wicked things that lurked on the internet to get our children. Meanwhile, the creepypasta community was just as shocked as anyone else to learn about this, probably more than the average person because of their proximity to these, these same stories that apparently drove children to try and kill each other. A popular creepypasta narration YouTube channel Mr. Creepypasta, hi, thanks, I listened to a lot of your videos while I was researching this one, organized a 24-hour fundraiser live stream in which the Creepypasta community came together to raise money for the victim of the stabbing. She lived, by the way, I don't think I mentioned that, she's fine. So yeah, it was very shocking uh, for people in involved in the Creepypasta community to see this thing that was a source of fun for them used in such a dark way. The mainstream reporting around the stabbing was absolutely what we would call a moral panic. And buddy, we've seen it all before. In 1997, the unknown horrors of the internet were blamed for the Heaven's Gate mass cult suicide. Then it was violent video games and Marilyn Manson being responsible for Columbine. In the 1920s, the murder of a child by two teenagers was blamed on the hot new media of the time, detective novels. Anxieties from the older generation about new media brain poisoning and mind controlling our children into doing horrible things are eternal. Because when shocking, horrible things happen to kids, people need to latch on to something to cope. They need to latch on to some easy explanation. Slenderman is on the internet. Take away your kid's iPad is a much easier fix than our entire mental health care system is disastrously broken. <laughs> I'm not American, by the way, but I'm I will lump Canada in there. Not great either. In the years that followed the Wisconsin stabbing, the media jumped to link all kinds of other crimes to Slender Man. There was a girl who set her family's house on fire who had drawn photos of Slender Man. There was this man who shot three people and photos of him surfaced dressed as Slender Man for Halloween. In a string of teen suicides on a Lakota reservation, some of the kids might have known about Slender Man. Obviously this is insane. Slender Man was not the problem in any of these cases, Slenderman was a very popular character at this point. Moral panics. I explained a little bit in my previous video, Creepypastas as Internet Folklore. It's kind of a preliminary reading for this video, to be honest. You'll get more out of both videos if you watch both of them. Fun fact. Uh, but in that video, I explained a bit about the term ostention, which is this word that academics use to describe the sort of acting out of folklore, the bringing of folklore into real life. So like when you go into the bathroom and turn off all the lights and chant Bloody Mary with your friends, that is you doing ostention. The Wisconsin stabbing is ostention taken to its most shocking and extreme. In the case of digital folklore, they also use the term reverse ostention to describe how people's real life actions also contribute to the creation of the folklore. And that was absolutely the case when the Wisconsin stabbing happened. Slenderman stories after that point, began to skew a lot more violent. There was this 2018 movie that was made, largely hated, largely seen as completely missing the point of Slender Man. It focused very heavily on his ability to mind control people into committing violent acts. The movie was called Distasteful by the parents of one of the girls responsible for the stabbing, and theaters in the area where it happened refused to show the film out of respect. In The Emperor's New Lore, or Who Believes in the Big Bad Slender Man, Michael J. Coven consciously, and rather pretentiously, takes a dump all over this emerging field of digital folklore and says, no, 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 no. Slenderman and other creepypastas cannot possibly ever be called folklore because we are aware of their origins and the fact that they are fictional. There is no believability here. He even talked to a whole 36 people under the age of 25 and they said they didn't believe in Slenderman. So case closed, I guess. He does say one thing that's really interesting though. He suggests that alternatively, the, the modern legend that has emerged here is not literally Slender Man, but Slender Man's possible effects. There is this dark and wicked thing that, that you barely comprehend lurking within your child's iPad that could do horrible things to them. What exactly will it do? Make them violent? Make them depressed? Antisocial? Suicidal? 
you've heard all kinds of things. This slender man stabbing is all over the news and other cases that seem to be similar. You've heard things from friends, maybe local schools have put out notices about it. I think that Michael's got a point with this one. Really made me realize that I have failed to consider the boomer perspective in all of this. I'm coming at this as someone who also grew up on creepypastas. The girls responsible for the stabbing in Wisconsin are three years younger than me, the same age as my sister. People my age might have literally believed in Slender Man for a minute there, but our parents believed that he was a mind-corrupting internet trend that could convince children to stab each other for fun. Amazing job on that one, boomers. Amazing job. Monsters are stand-ins for real-world others. Like, capital O, others. Things or people which we're very afraid of, perhaps too afraid of, to look at directly. Therefore, we create monsters to articulate why we fear these things. About Slenderman, Andrea Kitta writes, I think there is a core spiritual experience here that connects with others. The feeling of being watched that has been turned into a narrative about a specific entity since it is a convenient way to discuss an untellable experience. What does it mean to feel watched? You know, we're under surveillance pretty much constantly these days. Thanks to our constant internet connections, we're never alone. When Slenderman's presence interferes with technology, it demonstrates our anxieties about our dependence on that technology. Marvel Hornets, I think, genuinely does this extremely well. The way that it makes this jump from you cannot trust a video to depict reality as it is to you cannot trust your own senses or your own mind. We have become one with our technology and Slenderman takes away control on every level. Slenderman is something primal, the embodiment of the woods, of chaos. He is fundamentally in opposition to technology and civilization and all of these orderly things we have built. Shira Chess and Eric Newsom write, What does it say then, that from the culture of selfies and self-surveillance on social media, that we see a monster rise who appears when we turn the camera on ourselves and reveals no face? Slenderman's targeting of children and young adults, as well as the character's popularity with those demographics, suggests perhaps that Slenderman represents a fear of growing up, of becoming something foreign to yourself, of losing your identity to this literal embodiment of faceless corporate power. Depictions of the uncanny, things like Slenderman, which are not quite human, raise these questions. What is humanity then? What is normal? What is natural? What is real? Can you trust a photograph? Can you trust your own memory? Can you trust the internet? Are the experiences that you have there real in the same way that offline life is? Can you trust the capitalist powers that control social media? Who even are you? Is the face that you put all over the internet even yours anymore? Oh, Slender Man, you're an interesting guy. Thank you, friends, for joining me this week in my musings about Slender Man. Next week, we're in for a tone shift as I dress up as the sexy goat Satan for Halloween. Remember to go check out this video's sponsor, Scentbird, and I will see you in another one very soon, my friends.